Shalom and welcome to Shomer Mitzvot, Torah Observant, a series on practical messianic living and apologetics. I'm the author, Torah teacher Ariel ben Lyman Hanavi. Torah observance is a matter of the heart. It always has been and always will be. The Torah proper instructed the people of Israel to love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your resources. This is where Shomer Mitzvot begins, by loving Hashem and accepting Him on His terms. By this, I mean accepting His means of covenant obedience. For today, this means acceptance of Yeshua, His only Son, for Jew and non-Jew alike. Avinu Malkinu, our Father, our King, Lord, I thank you that we have the opportunity to come together and study and to uh, fellowship together. It's always good to be able to come together under your name. Father, we realize that this is a privilege, and we count it a privilege whenever we have the opportunity because we know that um, in this country, it is a freedom that we enjoy. It's not a freedom that other people enjoy in other countries, and so we pray for those people. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit will be here to teach us tonight. Um, you are the one who authored the scriptures and you are the one who knows it best and we want to be able to um, press in in such a way as to be pleasing to you um, to uh, engage the text where you would have us uh, um, learn things um, Father we confess that we simply don't have all the answers and so we look to you as our guide bless you Father for all the wonderful things that you're doing in this harvest in this community um, for the changes that are taking place, for the positive, uh, for lives that are being uh, um, challenged, and uh, for the souls that are being won for the kingdom. So bless you, Father, for all your wonderful things. In Yeshua's authority, we proclaim them. Amen. Okay, today is Monday, January 19th, 2009. This is Pesach, season of our deliverance. And my name is Ariel bin Lyman Hanavi. This is a 14-week study, and we are on Technically, we're on week two now. Since we missed a week, we'll just call this week two. Question right up front real quick. I do. I'm sorry. Um, if someone will assist me, since I can't reach you. How many more do you need? Just two. Here's one. Two. I should have just stapled them, but the machine wouldn't staple that amount. So if you stop by the office afterwards, then or between the break, I'm sure we've got that heavy-duty stapler. That'll stable like 60 sheets or something. That should work for you. So this is a 14-week study. Uh, we're uh, Technically, this will be week two since we missed last week. Um, we are also scheduled to miss a week sometime coming up in, I think, the next month or two um, for Purim. But other than that, uh, it's a very kind of freestyle study. I don't have a syllabus that we're following. You've got the written notes in front of you, which are what, um, 20 pages? Somebody want to turn to the very end and tell me? 24, okay. Um, this study is also available online for those listening by way of um, internet right now. You can go to graftedin.com and from the uh, home page, click on the commentaries link along the very top. And then from the menu on the left, click on feast days. And right there near the top of the page, this is the second study called Pesach. There is a PDF version, which is printable. It'll print out the fonts and it'll keep the format just like you're looking at. There are audio files already available online, four um, files, part A through part D, about 30 minutes, 40 minutes each. Um, they are basically the audio companion to the written version that you're holding. Again, I'm repeating this for the people on, uh, who are listening by way of the internet as well. Um, 
what I'm going to do with this study is I'm going to I'm going to upload it right next to the existing audio portions and I'll label it live and so you'll end up with four that are studio and then 13 or so if I'm correct 12 that are um, this live class that we're listening to and it'll just say week one week two week three that sort any questions before we know let me start with some liturgy as usual and then uh, we'll jump into the study um, I'm gonna read the Shema tonight so if you want to follow along I'm, I'm gonna start with Deuteronomy 6 4 through 9 and then I'm gonna jump to Deuteronomy um, 11 13 through 21 and then I'll finally I'll jump over to numbers 15 37 through 41 unfortunately um, I'll be reading Hebrew I'll write along with the English so I don't know if you've got who Ray trying to even have a Eng Hebrew English you've got one right you've got one too um, you've got it online there really oh you've got it hey you got the whole thing there cool all right and for for ease I'm just gonna be reading it straight out of the Siddur English hero Israel Adonai is our God Adonai the one and only you shall love Adonai your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your resources let these matters that I command you today be upon your heart. Teach them thoroughly to your children and speak of them while you sit in your home, while you walk on the way, when you retire and when you arise. Bind them as a sign upon your arm. And let them be tefillin between your eyes and write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. I'll read all of the English and then I'll go back and read all of the Hebrew. And it will come to pass that if you continually hearken to my commandments that I command you today, to love Adonai your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will provide rain for your land in its proper time, the early and late rains, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. I will provide grass in your field for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. Beware lest your heart be seduced, and you turn astray and serve gods of others and bow to them. Then the wrath of Adonai will blaze against you. He will restrain the heavens so there will be no rain, and the ground will not yield its produce, and you will be swiftly banished, banished from the goodly land which Adonai gives you. Place these words of mine upon your heart and upon your soul. Bind them for a sign upon your arm, and let them be to feel in between your eyes. Teach them to your children to discuss them while you sit in your home while you walk on the way, when you retire and when you arise, and write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates in order to prolong your days and the days of your children upon the ground that Adonai has sworn to your ancestors to give them like the days of the heaven on the earth. And now the Numbers passage. And Adonai said to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them that they are to make themselves tzitzit on the corners of their garments throughout their generations. And they are to place upon the tzitzit of each corner a thread of tachelet. And it shall constitute tzitzit for you that you may see it and remember all the commandments of Adonai and perform them and not explore after your heart and after your eyes after which you stray so that you may remember and perform all my commandments and be holy to your God for I am Adonai your God who has removed you from the land of Egypt to be a God to you. I am Adonai your God. And now I'll go back and just read the Hebrew for you real quick. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Ve'ahavtait Adonai Elohecha B'kol Avavchu V'kol Nafshakol V'kol Me'odecha V'hayu Hadvarim Ha'ile Asher Anochi Metzavcha Hayom Al Levavecha V'shin Antam Levanecha V'dibarate Bam B'shivtaka B'veitaka V'lechtaka V'derech U'v'shach B'kal V'kumecha that's the first passage. Okay, 
Uch sharatim otam laot al yedechem, vahayula totofot ben enechem, vali madim otam et be nechem, le de bear de bam, beshivtaka, bevetaka, vlechtaka, vederakuf shakbaka, uf kumeka, uch tav tam al mezuzot, betako vish arreka, lemaan yirbu, ye mechem, ve ye me venechem, al adama asher nish ba adonai, la avotechem, la tet lachem, ki ye me hashamayim al haaretz. And the final passage in Numbers. Vayumer Adonai el Moshe le mor darber el bene Yisrael varamarta alehim. Vaasu lahem tzitzit al kanfe vigdehem le dorotam vnat nu al tzitzit ha kanaf betil techelet. Vahaya lachem le tzitzit uritem oto us karatem et kol mitz vot Adonai vaasitem oto vlo taturu achre lavavchem vaachre enechem asher atem zonim. Achorehim, Lemaan tis koru, vasitem et kol mitzvotai, vihitem kodoshim le elohechem, ani adonai elohechem asher hutseti et chem me erts, mitzraim le hyot lachem le elohim, ani adonai elohechem. And that's the end of the Hebrew. The part that's really neat about the um, liturgy is that quite often the um, incident note is Yitziat Mitzraim, which is the exodus from Egypt is, and of course that's the focal point of our study, right, Passover? The exodus from Egypt? The Yitzit Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt, is such a monumental event in the mind of God that he, that he, um, he reminds us, Israel, to remember. He commands us to remember it, right? It's a, it's a zikaron, a remembrance. You are commanded to remember this, which means it must be perpetuated somehow in our generations. Whether we keep doing the Passover, whether we keep telling a story, or both, or in the case of the liturgy that we just read, we mention it. And so it's funny, even in this liturgy, in Numbers 15, 37 through 41, um, we have, I am the Lord your God who has removed you from the land of Egypt. Ani Adonai Elohechem asher hotseiti etchem me'erts mitzrayim. I am the Lord your God who delivered you from the land of Egypt. It becomes a household title of his. Who am I? I am the Lord your God who delivered you from the house of Egypt, or from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. And so it, it really is a, it's a sad legacy that the, the emerging Christian church of the third and fourth century decided to divorce herself from her Hebraic roots and leave the Passover behind as something that's Jewish or Hebraic or outdone, outmoded, um, fulfilled in Jesus so we don't have to remember it anymore. Because God gets a lot of mileage out of our memory and he gets a lot of mileage out of um, our walking into those things which he has done for us in the past. And so I don't know about you, but I cannot wait for the day when Yeshua comes back and the the large segment of his followers who have walked away from this particular festival will have their eyes open to realize what did we leave behind 2,000 years ago? Oy vey, why did we do that? The rich legacy that's been that's, that's here for us. You guys agree with so far? Okay. And so um, Judaism, picking up on that, has incorporated that into their liturgy just about everywhere we turn. Um, you know, uh, it's in the... It, I mean, if you pray the set time prayers, and we talked about this two weeks ago, the set time prayers correspond, by the way, with the set time when the sacrifices were being performed in the temple at the, during the time. So we had, the, uh, we had a, a morning time when the priests were officiating, and that was known as the shakarit. And so when people were bringing sacrifices, the people who were at home were praying at the same time. Thus, the set time to pray in the community was in, a court, it was in, uh, uh, in, in, synchron in synchronization with the time that they were bringing the sacrifices during that offering time in the morning. So we had shakarit. And then there was another, then there was a time period when there was like a, you know, not a lot of um, sacrifices being offered in the middle of the day. And then as it got closer to around three in the afternoon, we had another time where the, um, the priests were going to take the sacrifices, basically bring them to a close. We called this the uh, mincha time. And so what the people in the community doing, they're praying again. There are more chairs if you want to go ahead and come in that we just have to pull them out of the corner and you just kind of have to sit along the sides. So um, for those of you who do pray the set time prayers or for those of you who don't have a time to remember um, uh, you know, things like this, the Passover, if you're not doing the, at least the Seder once a year or the Lord's Supper once a month or some, whenever your church does it, at least if you're praying the set time prayers, you're remembering this every day. 
All right. And if you need uh, commentaries, I've printed two more out. I apologize up front for no staples or holes. Just don't lose them. They're, the pages are numbered. Yeah, I have one more. The pages are numbered at least. That'll help you out a little bit in case you're... Everybody, this is my sister, Christy. My blood sister, not just my, you know, my soul sister, my sister. <laughs> All right, props to my family members back there. Uh, so um, so this, this Passover was meant to be something that is before us, even though it only happens once a year. I'll tell you the truth, the Passover itself, the event of Passover is like the, um, is like the, uh, how do we put it? It's like the foundation for the weekly Sabbath. The relationship between Passover to Sabbath, the church caught and has the same relationship between Easter and Sunday. The relationship of Easter to Sunday is the relationship to Passover to Shabbat. What did the church do? We just shifted the days and the uh, holidays. But they, they caught the meanings right. Is is the theme of deliverance, the theme of freedom, which Passover entails, of course. Makes sense, yes? That's why we call this season of our deliverance. I don't know about you, but year after year, I take inventory. I get introspective this time of year, at least around Passover. And I take inventory of my life, and I ask God, and this is always a scary prayer, right? Lord, show me me. Show me what you see, because he knows me better than I know myself. Show me what you see, at least what I can handle. <laughs> um, I, I would like to... I would like to, um, you know, I tell God, I would like to uh, reshape my life during this time. I would like to re, 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 revitalize my life. I'd like to clean up areas that are, you know, that got cobwebs. You all know that during Passover, as we lead into Passover, there's this ceremony known as the uh, Bidachat Chameit, searching for the leaven in our homes. Because the whole week of, of Passover, a week of unleavened bread, um, Chag Hamatot, seven days where we're not to have leaven in our homes, we, we, the, the, the search for leaven in our homes is a spiritual picture of what? Of getting the sin out of our lives. Now, we're not, we can't be sinless, but I, I had a friend who says, you know what, um, you know what sanctification looks like? He said, basically, it's the, the, the longer you go on in God, the less and less you sin. It's kind of a simplified way of looking at it. I'm not, I won't be sin free until Yeshua comes back, but from from this year, from year to year, I should be sinning less, especially in areas of my life that are repetitive. You know, I shouldn't be walking it, I shouldn't be stepping in the same doo-doo every year, okay? Because life is cyclical, and that's why the, the cycle, the, um, uh, the seasons come around year after year, because cycles provide cleansing. That's very Hebraic, right? Cycles provide cleansing. Not only in nature, you know, we've got these clouds, and uh, precipitation forms. The clouds drop the water to the land. The land, hit, the water hits the ground, ground. It washes down to the rivers and the streams, and finally gets collected and goes back out to the ocean. And then precipitation happens, and or uh, evaporation again. And it goes back up in the clouds, and it starts all over again. What's happening though? Things are getting cleansed. Um, and that's how that's the way God designed the Hebraic the Hebrew calendar. It's cyclical, so that we can go year after year and continually cleanse and get cleaned up. It's unfortunate that the Greek model or the Greek mindset is not cyclical, but linear. So that in Greek mindset, you always move forward. You want to progress, which is probably why in most church circles, Christians who think that we are going back under the law use that phraseology, you're going back. No, we're not going back. We're going around. Do you guys understand that now? Okay. And it's, it's better to do it God's way. I'd rather not leave things that God said not to leave. Because God has a way of making me go back around and, and catch those things again anyway. So, so here's what happens. Here's the doo-doo that I stepped in last year. And so I cried out to God, Oy vey, I'm sorry, I didn't want to do that. I didn't mean to step in that doo-doo, so I'm working my way down through the year. And as Passover comes around, there's that doo-doo again. Do I want to step in that again? Is it polite, cleric to say doo-doo? Is that, do I have to edit that out? No? Okay. There's the doo-doo I stepped in last year. I don't want to do that again. Uh, cyclically speaking, I should at this point in time have the Holy Spirit within me to go, Ariel, that's what you stepped in last year. By the Spirit of God, get delivered from that. Don't step in that again. Don't make the same old mistakes. No, I'll make new mistakes, true. But the point is, 
this is growth because I'm not stepping in the same things over and over again. So what's sanctification? The process of sinning less and less as the Holy Spirit works within me. And that's exactly what Romans 8 tells me, right? All things work together for my good, so that for, the, for those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Um, my purpose, and of course I'm paraphrasing that, that passage 8, 28, and 29, the purpose of our lives is to be conformed in the pattern of Yeshua. And none of us arrives when we step off the boat, so it takes cycles for us to get through that sanctification process. Make sense so far? All right, Passover is the beginning of the cycle. So before Passover happened, where was, where was Israel? They were deep in the doo-doo. And the, and the beautiful part about the Passover is that when you're, when you're, when you're knee-deep in it, or in Israel's case, I guess they were probably hip-deep or maybe armpit-deep, um, you can't get yourself out. The deliverance is supernatural. It's, from, it's outside of you. Israel couldn't save herself from Egypt. God had to step in and create an event that ejected Israel out of Egypt. God messed with the Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt. And we know that God intervened and Moshe was the savior in that case. And so the people were put into a place where they could get out. God opened the door and the people took the exit, took, took the exit out. The same is true in our personal lives. No one is born free per se. At some point in time, you find yourself mired in your own doo-doo, your own personal sin, and guess what? You can't get yourself out. You can try if you want. It ain't going to work. Human ingenuity is not going to get you out. Eventually, you will have to cry out for a Savior. And that Savior is the same one that delivers back then, God himself, through the agent of his Zorah, his right arm, which is Yeshua. And so you cry out to God, and God will save you. And so that's why I say that the Passover itself is not only just a season of our deliverance, but it is one of the clearest Moedim, one of the clearest festivals that points to Yeshua. Because he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so if you don't know Yeshua this season, it's a great time to find him during the Passover season. Okay? Any questions real quick along those lines? All right. What I want to do tonight, since I gave you the handout already, which... which um, is great because maybe this will help you start formulating questions. What I want you to do is, um, and maybe if you have a blank piece of paper or someone has extra piece of paper, I want to start formulating some of the questions that we're going to be tackling in this class. I want you to be able to have um, issues that are addressed. I don't have all the answers, but I got a lot of resources and I'm pretty good with them. Plus, we have the ultimate resource in this room. We have God's Word and God's Spirit. Those two together, that doesn't mean He's going to give us all the answers. But we might come up with some answers that we never had before. Plus, the rest, perhaps, is just things that maybe we just have never really dialogued on. We've never really discussed. So um, start formulating some questions for this class for me. If you can even get some to me at the end of the class and turned in, I'll start addressing some of them. Otherwise, if you, if you notice in the commentary right on page one, You'll see, does everyone have a commentary, by the way? Raise your hand if you don't have one, because I, I don't have any extras at the moment. Everyone's got one? I could actually at least tonight read through understanding the Passover season, for those of you who don't know. Um, I, I assume that most of you do. But I don't know who will be listening to this, because this goes out worldwide. So some people don't know what the Passover is about. Um, right on page one at the bottom, there are a few different commentaries that I've decided to support in, uh, in, in, in my choice of putting this commentary together. One of our former members here has a commentary that's online uh, at his website there. You can see the link at the bottom of page one. And you can look at that. And it kind of goes off in the direction of the harmony of the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, and try and figure out some of the timing issues around Passover. I'm not going to focus on that right now. So just turn to page two and look at the top. And let's read through page from two through the top of page three. I think I can get through that tonight and at least that will give us the um, background to Passover. And then maybe we'll open it up and start doing some questions too, some issues. Because I've got questions. I've got issues I want to throw at you guys and see if maybe you guys can help me s solve them. And if not, I'm sure you guys have some questions too. All right. Understanding the Passover season. We're at the top of page two. I want to provide the readers with a concise look at Passover by supplying a direct quote from a book I highly recommend reading called... The Seven Festivals of the Messiah by Eddie, uh, Edward Chumney, and it's available through Treasure House Publishing, and you can also read the book entirely online at the link there, www.hebrews.org. Raise your hand if you're familiar with the book, you've got the book, you've read the book, you liked it, didn't like it, whatever. One. One person. Okay. Um, it's not a bad book. Um, 
Eddie Chumney co- approaches it from a two-house perspective. I will give you that disclaimer. Raise your hand if you don't know what I mean when I say two-house perspective. Everyone here kind of does for the most. Two-house perspective for those also listening who don't may not know is a um, is a a um, a biblical position that focuses on the identity issue in the Messiah today and likes to teach, imagine, purport that um, many of the Christians who are, who are very hungry for Torah are probably lost sheep of Israel. Maybe Ephraim, the last lost ten tribes got scattered during the first exile. Um, and that the Holy Spirit is now calling them back and their love for Torah is evidenced or is evidence of perhaps their their um, physical tie to Israel. Thus, two house. We say when we say two house, if you ask a two houser if they're a Jew, they will, they'll tell you, no, I'm not a Jew. But if you ask them if they're a Christian, they'll probably say they're not a Christian either. Oftentimes, they'll say, no, I'm Ephraim. And as a, as a, over and against Judah, their brother. And so, two house refers to the ten houses of the north and the uh, three houses on the bottom. Um, Levi, Benjamin, and Judah that stayed and got captured in the Babylonian captivity. Uh, the ten northern tribes got scooped up by um, uh, Assyria, Assyria. And so, um, again, that's that's typically two houses. Eddie Chumney's a two-houser. That doesn't stop him, however, from preaching the Passover. I, I don't have serious disagreements with two-housers. I have my reservations about some two-house theology, but um, much of it is biblical, so this isn't the class to deal with that per se. But I want to give that on uh, that that I know some people who will before they read someone's commentary they want to know that person's background before they start putting that person's words in their head. This is the background on Eddie Chumney. Um, I've dialogued with him before. I've asked him if I could use this stuff online. He says fine. Um, in chapter three, pages twenty-three to twenty-five, he provides this vital background look at understanding the overall message of the Passover, the Pesach, and its relevance and fulfillment in Yeshua the Messiah. And since it's so concise, I'll go ahead and read it for you. Um, Just FYI, for those listening, there are a lot of um, references that are strewn throughout the the, uh, explanation. I won't read the references, but those of you who have the written commentaries and those of you who are following along online can see them. God declared Passover to be a permanent celebration for all eternity. Historically, Passover, or Pesach by its Hebrew name, celebrates God's deliverance of the children of Israel from bondage in Egypt, where they were slaves to the Egyptians. The spiritual application that God wants us to understand is this. Egypt, which the Hebrew name is Mitzrayim, is a type of the world and the world's system. Its ruler, Pharaoh, was a type of Satan or Hasatan. And the bondage people are in when they live according to the ways of the world system is sin. Thus, everybody, if I can get Pesher style on you now, um, everybody goes through, or everybody is in Egypt to some degree or another at some point in time. But once you place your faith in the blood of the Lamb, you have an opportunity to come out of Egypt. So really, even at that very early stage, if you think about it, Passover really is for every believer. We could draw uh, an application right there. Thus, the traditional Christian um, answer that Passover is not for us because we're not Israel or we're not Jewish or something like that falls apart at this level right now. Also, the, the prevailing Jewish um, position, halakhic position that that not only Jews can keep the Passover falls apart at this level too. Everybody following along with me on that level? Great. Okay. Um, I mentioned something just a moment ago. Oh, Pesher style. Pesher style is um, you'll read a passage and then you'll just keep interjecting your own comments and then you'll keep reading. That's Pesher style explanation. Paul's, Paul liked to do that a lot. I like to do it as well. Um, let's keep going. The spiritual... I already read that one. Um, Historically, the children of Israel were delivered from the bondage of Egypt by putting the blood of a lamb upon the doorposts of their houses. Now, if you think about it, stop again. You know, 3,500 years ago, was there any precedent for putting lamb's blood on a house to get out of slavery? Anybody? No? They had no reason to believe that silly... Uh, and I'm using the word silly for for effect. There's no reason to believe a, a, that silly um, application is going to do anything. So thus we can see that right away they had faith. You know they're watching they're watching front seat with this Moses versus Pharaoh, and you know Moses is like ten for ten or nine for nine at this point in time. They're thinking his track record's pretty good. You know 
everything he said so far is gonna ha has, has happened. So here we are, the last one, the final, the death of the firstborn. Eh, we're gonna go with Moses. We're gonna put our bets on him. So there's a, there was an there was an exercise of faith, and faith is always, as is typical in the Torah, faith is always coupled with an action. We have we have something that that grabs a hold of the heart and the mind, and is walked out by the by the feet by the by the by the body. You know, they didn't just say, we believe you, Moses. And Moses said, good, what you going to do about it? And they said, we're going to root for you, Moses. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to believe that somehow we're going to get out of Egypt. No. Moses would say to them, if you believe, then put the blood on the doorpost. Your actions must accompany your faith. We talked about that in previous lessons. Faith and faithfulness are struck the same coin. There's no two ways around it. If you have faith, you will be faithful. And your faithfulness is evidence of your genuine faith. They work together. One's a vindication of the other, and one leads to the other. There's no genuine faith without faithfulness, and faithfulness is always evidence of genuine faith. Period. End of story. So, the children of Israel were delivered. Why? Because at that brief moment, they had faith in God. They had faith in the blood. Spiritually, this is a picture of the Messiah, Yeshua, and how those who believe in him are delivered from the bondages of sin and the rule of Satan in their lives. And Paul tells us explicitly in Corinthians, I think it's chapter maybe around 14 or so, 15, um, 16, somewhere in there. He says to the Gentiles, he explains to them, you know, before Messiah came into your life, you were led about by idols. You're led about by the spiritual world. Whether you believed or not or whether you knew it or not, everybody's a slave. There's no, you have no choice in the matter. At some point in time, um, you're, maybe you're a slave to your own passions. Maybe you're a slave to... Um, secular humanism. Maybe you say, I'm not a pagan. I'm not a, I'm not a, you know, I don't follow after other gods. I know lots of people who say that. I'm basically a good person. You know, how can God send me to hell? I don't follow after any kind of idolatrous system. I just do the best I can. Well, you're a slave to your own human I in ingenuity. <laughs> You've created a God within yourself, and he's probably you, and you just don't name him that, right? But everyone's in bondage at some point in time. Yeshua is also our Passover, those who follow Yeshua are the house of God. We're the spiritual house of God. The doorposts are our hearts. It's very easy to see, right? So we place the blood of Yeshua on the doorposts of our hearts, and it's through this trusting by faith in the shed blood of Yeshua, our Passover lamb, that we are free from the bondages of sin. And that's the only way. But also, if you notice in the Passover story with Egypt, or with I Israel and Egypt in the, in the Exodus account, once they got out of Egypt, God promised or God commanded them never to go back to Egypt. Don't go back there, okay? Your genuine deliverance is evidenced by your continuing on with me. I brought you out to bring you in. Bring you in where? Where's God leading them to? Promised land, which is a type and shadow of the world to come, the age to come, or heaven itself. So God brings us out of our own personal sin to bring us into a glorious promise that he has for us. So we have faith that he brought us out, and we have faith that he's bringing us in. Lack of faith in any part of that will... F will, will will abort the salvation process. We turn our back on God. I don't want, we don't want to go there. So, we're free from the bondage of sin. This is because the blood of Yeshua redeems us from sin. And there's a bunch of passages that are very helpful right in the middle of the commentary. Bottom of page two. During Pesach, during Passover, the head of each household was to take a lamb or a goat, by the way. Anybody ever hear Yeshua refer to as... Behold the goat of God that takes away the sin of the world. We're always familiar with the lamb. Lamb is the, the animal of choice. But if you read Exodus chapter 12, it says lamb or goat. Give me a goat. Um, the, lamb, uh, the head of the household was to take a first year lamb on the 10th day of the first month, known as Nisan, and set it aside until the 14th day. So we have four days to inspect it. In the evening on the 14th day at exactly 3 p.m. in the afternoon, the la which is called the Bain Ha'arba'im, the, the, the between the evenings period, between 3 and the set, the beginning of the sun to set towards the uh, uh, setting below the horizon. That's the evening and the evening, between the evenings, Bain Ha'arba'im. So around 3 o'clock, right in the middle there, noon, 3, 6 o'clock, if we were to just chop it off neatly. The lamb was killed. The blood of the lamb was sprinkled on the lintel and the two posts of the household door. The lamb was to be roasted with fire, with bitter herbs, and with unleavened bread, and the entire household was to feast upon the body of the lamb. None of it was to be left until morning. None of its bones were to be broken, etc. We, we already know that the picture is at this point towards Yeshua. The people were instructed by God to eat the lamb with haste and to be dressed and ready to leave Egypt. This is an interesting um, feature of the Passover that I don't believe many 
claim to be believers quite catch. When God said that the Exodus, back the, the very first Exodus, the prototype, when the first Exodus was to be enacted, they were to eat with their f- shoes on, their coats on, their belts on their waist, basically ready to get out of there. And when the death angel came through and slew all the firstborn, and then they left the next morning, by the way, they left in the, in the morning time. Um, they didn't leave that night. When they left the next morning, they got out of Egypt. They didn't dilly-dally and sit around, and go, hey, let's wait another week and see if maybe, see if anything else changes. You know, I got time. Well, now that the, the door's open, I, I got time to leave. You know, let me just pack my stuff. Let me just, you know, take care of my business. I'll leave in a month or two. No. God says, get up, get out. The doorway is here. Um, what does that tell you about the salvation picture? What do you guys think? Is it something we can lollygag and take our time about? Especially if the Spirit of God is opening the door and giving you an opportunity to get out of your own personal sin. So you, so you go down the aisle, you feel, co- you feel convicted as you're sitting in your pew to get up and go down the aisle and make a profession of faith. You go down the aisle, you go through the Romans road or the four spiritual laws or whatever the person that leads you through, and you go through a salvation experience at your church or your synagogue. And then after that, what are you supposed to do? Go home and start living like you've always been living? Get out of Egypt. Get out. Leave that old stuff behind. Get out and get out, get out, get on your, get on your way fast. Because <laughs> you never know when the doorway might close and the opportunity might not present itself then. I, I mean, I can't, can, can only wonder what happened to some people who probably maybe put the blood on the doorpost but didn't leave that night, decided they'd hang out. We don't have a record of it, so we're just kind of imagining, right? I think I'll just hang out for a while. You know, I, I don't, I'm not ready to leave yet. You know, I haven't packed, really. God said, like, eat in haste. He didn't tell us to give us any time to pack. I mean, gosh, you know, four days, inspect the lamb, and then roast it, and we're out of here. You know, i got to close business deals. I have to, you know, get all, withdraw my money from my bank account of Egypt. You know, i gotta, I got to get my, my stuff in order. You know, that brand-new car I just leased, I can't walk away from that. You know, the house I'm just, that I just, you know, got from the bank, I can't walk away from that. No, God says, get out. So they were, when, they, when they were supposed to get out, they were supposed to get out, quick. Eat in haste to get out. I think we don't carry that lesson in our, uh, again, in the, uh, in the spiritual application aspect. I, 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 I know people who have made professions of faith. Here's my application. They've made professions of faith to believe in Yeshua, but their lives are no different from before they made their profession and afterwards. Aren't you saved? Yeah, I'm saved, you know, but you know, I'll get my act cleaned up sooner or later. Well, you know, one day I'll give up my pot or give up my porn or, you know, stop beating my wife or whatever. Someday? What did God say? Eat it with your belt around your waist, your cloak on, your feet shod. Get out. Get out quick. So I think we don't catch that. We don't catch that. So I, and my understanding is the salvation experience should be something that we, we don't lollygag about. Make your profession. Move on with God. Question. Well, it was still drawn out then. They ate, they ate, the, they ate the lamb that night, but they didn't leave till the next morning. They didn't leave in the middle of the night. Yeah, but actually we shouldn't. We don't have to. Um, and we talked about this last week. She, uh, she brought up a big question for those who, who didn't hear her question. She said, in our Seders tonight, we just kind of relax. In fact, you've been through a Seder, yes? Most everybody, who hasn't been through a Seder? Everybody has. During the Seder, don't we have a time where we recline? Okay, yeah. The reason why is because the very first Passover in Exodus is the prototype. Every other Passover after that is a relaxing time period. Only the first one was, was the paradigm to get out. After that, it is a, mem- is a memorial. We can relax. But my, and so your point is actually valid as well, is that for those who um, haven't, don't know Yeshua yet, I, I think they still need to have that sense of urgency about them. Um, but, and the point I'm trying to make, which I'm sure you caught, is that for those who, who are just kind of taking their time getting out of Egypt, don't do that. Don't do that. That's not the biblical picture. Get up, get out. That's what God's saying. So, that was good, by the way. Um, the blood of the lamb was to be sprinkled on the lentil. We read that the people were instructed by God to eat the lamb with haste and be dressed and ready to leave at the midnight hour. This would be on the 15th day of Nisan to be ready to go. Um, at midnight on that faithful evening in Egypt, death passed throughout the land. Every house that did not have the token of the blood on the doorpost and lentil suffered the judgment of God 
The Hebrew word for Passover is Pesach, which means to pass or hover over. There's a, a couple of other meanings that we'll probably pull into later on in the study. But the general idea is Pesach does, or Pasach is the, um, the root verb, and Pasach means passing over, um, or passed over, I'm sorry. It's uh, uh, typically the verbs in Hebrew and the uh, call stem are, um, are, in the, are in the completed sense, the perfect tense. So this would mean passed over, not pass over or hover over. It's actually done. The word speaks to us about two things. First, it shows the passing over and judgment from death and sin to life in Yeshua. Second, it tells us about allowing by faith the blood of Yeshua to hover over our lives and give us divine protection from the evil one. And if you scroll to the bottom of the page, you'll see that's exactly where I took the um, quote from HebrewRoots.com slash HebrewRoots number seven, uh, uh, fe seven festivals of, or I'm sorry, seven festivals book. And if you're using a um, PC as opposed to a Macintosh right now, and you're reading this online, if you click on the link, it'll take you straight to that commentary online. At, at uh, In other words, the links are hot links. So... Having laid the framework for Passover, I, I wish now to turn in a different direction. I'm just continuing to read the little last little paragraph. Uh, different direction for this commentary. Why does traditional rabbinic Judaism so vehemently reject the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ? In other words, I talked about how that God's festivals, the Moedim, they are dress rehearsals of messianic redemption. That's what they are. In fact, the word Moed, which is meeting or appointment, the modern Hebrew word for Moed conveys dress rehearsal. The idea of in a dress rehearsal, you go through the motions as actors as if it were the live performance so that on the day of the performance, you perform exactly like you rehearsed. The only difference is this is a rehearsal and this is the live performance. But the, the acting shouldn't be any different, right? You go through the same motions. God built that into his Moedim, into his festivals, which we're gonna, I'm going to turn to uh, Leviticus here in a moment, and we'll see. God basically said to Israel, I'm going to give you dress rehearsals that year after year, there's that cycle again, year after year, as you walk into these, as you rehearse year after year, one day the live show is going to hit the scene. And you're going to walk right into it and not going to skip a beat because you will have rehearsed correctly. What does that say for those of us in the body who aren't rehearsing we're going to miss the show because we haven't been rehearsing we're, we're going to miss our cues we don't know our parts and you're waiting for the Christmas tree to be lit and, and it's never going to get lit yeah <laughs> may get torched one of these days <laughs> so yes that's a good and so the point is God told Israel look these are dress rehearsals of messianic redemption these, these speak to my son they speak of his ministry on earth his intercession, his death, burial, his resurrection, and his first coming and his second coming. And Yeshua perfectly fulfilled the spring festivals in his first coming and will fulfill perfectly the second, uh, uh, during his second coming, the fall feasts. So Israel, when Yeshua, when, 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 the, when, the, when the quintessential actor showed up on the scene, they should not have missed it. They shouldn't have missed it. They shouldn't have missed him. They should, but some people caught it. They're like... <gasps> That's why they were singing Hoshana. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They recognize it because they'd been to the rehearsals. Those with hardened hearts, they missed it. We don't want to be those who either have hardened hearts or those who just aren't going through it. But you're saying, Ariel, the Passover's already done. Israel still needs another Passover. She's still in Egypt. She's been physically delivered from Egypt, but in her ignorance, she's still in spiritual Egypt. The evidence is the fact, remember the Pharisees, the Purushim, Yeshua was talking about, I am the... I am, um, let's see, what did he say? Um, uh, one of his sayings, he said, um, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, Yeshua said. And they said, we've never been slaves to anyone. You guys remember, remember the Pharisees' answer? We're not slaves, we've never been slaves to anyone. I think it's in John chapter 4, somewhere around then. John chapter 10 maybe. We're not slaves, we've never been slaves to anyone. If I was Yeshua, I would have pulled the three stooges, line them all up, slap, 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 slap. You know? Larry Curly Moe, right there on the spot. I, 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 <laughs> this is me, right? I, Yeshua, I would have looked at him and said, never been slaves to anyone. Number one, you're in spiritual slavery because you guys can't even see who, who's standing in front of you. And number two, did you guys not remember the Exodus? Never been slaves to anyone? Hello. So they, they didn't get it. They were, they were bent on his destruction. At least those particular rulers were. So what I'm going to do um, sometime in my commentaries, I'm gonna, we're going to turn and look at 
what about Christianity is so wrong to the Jewish mind? What is so foul about Jesus that turns the Jewish nose? We can't understand that sometimes. You know, it's a little bit of the way we cast Jesus, but it's a little bit of their own blindness as well. We're going to look at both. It's not all our fault. When I say our, I'm speaking as a Christian. If the Torah, the writings, and the prophets, a.k.a. the Tanakh, if they articulate so foundationally about the Messiah to come, why does the historic synagogue harbor such a carefully calculated dismissal of what Christians have come to hold so dearly? It is to those questions and their answers that my comedy, my comedy, my commentary is going to turn. So at that point in time, it's about 7.40. That's all I want to do for now is give you that overview of the Passover. Have you guys started formulating some questions? Because we have about, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, in this class, and there's a 10 minute break, and then my next class starts here, which is what is food? I don't have any printouts for that yet because we're going to just start reading scripture. You have a question right up front? Great. On this here, you have I feel like the Bible answer man. Hang canagraph. That's a good question. Her question was um, she heard that, the, you know, that we got the Passover, the word for Passover is um, Pasach, which means to pass over or hover over, and she's heard that in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 or two actually, Pasuk two, um, we have the word hovered in there. You want to know what the original Hebrew was. Um, in English it says, in the, beginning God, in the beginning of God's creating the heavens and the earth, verse two is the one you want. Uh, when the, I'm reading, by the way, from the stone edition Tanakh, because it's got the Hebrew on the side here, so I can just turn around and read it right away. Um, when the earth was astonishingly empty with darkness upon the surface of a deep, and the divine presence, or your probably says in the spirit of God, hovered upon the surface of the waters. So we got the word hovered there. All right, I'll read the verse for you in Hebrew, and then I'll go back and tell you which word is what. Uh, verse 1, Breshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim ve'et ha-aretz. Verse 2, V'ha-aretz ha'ita tohu v'avohu v'choshek al p'nei tohom v'ruach Elohim m'rachefet al p'nei ha-mayim. The word for hovered is the word, the, the phrase I said, m'rachefet. The root word is rachaf, R-A-C-H-A-F, if you were to translate it back into English or using English letters, R-A-C-H-A-F. You can say it's not the same word as Pasach, which is would be like, no markers, which would be like P-A-S-A-C-H for Pasach. That's the root word for Pesach. <laughs> you have markers. Um, the, but the word you're asking for is uh, Rachaf, R-A-C-H-A-F. And it means um, hovering, but maybe brooding is a good picture. Think of like an evil, eagle brooding over her nest. And in fact, in the book of Isaiah, this word shows up again, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, so the Spirit of God protects us. The same word, rachaf, shows up. That's the word. So no, it's no, it's not the same word. Um, but Hebrew meanings are built on a principle known as stacking. So we have a, like a bowl, and we throw a bunch of words in there, and the bowl is the meaning. So what does the Hebrew word mean? Well, it's not that words have meaning. It's that meanings can assign a bunch of words. And so this is one of the words for, pa for hovering, passing over. I think that's what Eddie Chumney is trying to, trying to invoke when he talks about um, uh, the blood of Yeshua to hover over our lives and give us divine protection. I would opt for this word, lachaf. That's what the Spirit of God does there. So that's a good question. Anybody else got any other questions real quick off the top of your head? Yes. Um, Sounds harsh. <laughs> What's the penalty? Um, her question was: she she thinks it's somewhere in the Torah portions about the punishment for not keeping the Passover being cut off from your people. By the way, the let me just start and answer it this way first. Um, the punishment cut off, or the Hebrew word is karat, K-A-R-A-T, if we were to use English transliteration. Karat in 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 its immediate ancient Israeli sense was to be, first of all, physically put outside the gates of Israel. So think of a city with walls. This is, say, Jerusalem. And we got walls around the city. To be cut out first and foremost means to be put outside of the city gates. So you're out there. This is like this place of protection, and you were physically put out. You were excommunicated outside the city. You were put outside the city walls. You were, you were what do we say today when, when you get kicked out of a country or whatever? Well, that's what we use in church terms. What do we use that? It's similar to that, though. Like banished, like you're exiled. You, you know, leaders go into exile because they're kicked out of their own country. They run. They go into. Yeah, they run out. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, okay. So first and foremost, it means being kicked out. That's karat, cut off. 
But then spiritually speaking, it speaks of God's protection being taken off of you. The Spirit of God says, okay, now that you're out here, you're on your own to an extent. The body may die so that the Spirit itself may be delivered, you know. But, um, and Paul talks about that in Corinthians as well. But basically, um, I don't know where, I don't know of a passage that says directly, if you don't keep Passover, you'll be cut off. Because typically the Passover can be kept twice in one year. If you miss it the first time because you were Tameh, uh, because you were unclean, then you can um, keep it one month later. And so you wouldn't be really... In other words, there's a makeup quiz. So, uh, but there, the, the Torah does talk about that... No, and we're going to talk about this in this class. Like the, a, grace period. a grace period, I guess, yeah. There is um, There are requirements for the Passover, and one of the requirements is for the males, physical circumcision. And those who are not physically circumcised will be cut off. That's one. I'm surprised you guys haven't come up with that question yet. Somebody hasn't connected the dots and said, do we have to be circumcised today? I'll, I'll let it come when the, when the time comes and you guys want to talk about it. We'll discuss the question, but I, I, maybe you guys don't want to ask the question now. If not, I'm going to ask it for you because I know, I know some readers have always asked. I get that question every year around Passover. Do we have to be, per as believers, do we have to be circumcised to keep the Passover? It's a, the women are not asking, so they're like, right? <laughs> So that's a good question. Here's a question I want to throw at you guys. Um, since Passover and unleavened bread and first fruits or Bukurim or Omer uh Passover, unleavened bread, the festival, the, the first sheaf, and, and Shavuot are all timed together. They all stuck together. You guys have heard about the, um, the uh, debates over when uh, the, when the, um, when the uh, f uh, counting of the Omer begins and things like that. The count of the Omer will affect when you keep Shavuot 50 days later uh, and whether or not Jesus had a Passover if he was crucified on Good Friday and rose on Sunday. How does that work? Um, we're going to talk about some of those because they become relevant in our day and age. What ends up happening today is, um, and I'll close with this since I didn't see any other questions. We have a, a movement within Messianic circles, a movement that is, is, is deciding that since God said in the Bible that the Passover is determined by the sighting of the barley and the new moon is determined by the sighting of the barley, that the Passover season and, and the, the barley harvest itself, which the Passover is a barley harvest, right? Uh, Shavuot, by comparison, is a wheat harvest. The barley harvest is determined by the cycle of the moon and therefore um, the rabbinic calendar that many people follow doesn't key off of the wheat, I'm sorry, doesn't key off of the barley harvest. Therefore, because it doesn't, we should go back to the Bible and cite the moon like they did, like God told Moses to do. And then we'll know when our Passover should start and when our months should start. And in other words, the rabbis are wrong and we need to go back to the Bible. Raise your hand if you've heard any amount of that. Some of you some of you I'm not okay uh, I guess for those of you who haven't had a chance to get exposed to that bless you you're, you're, you're not missing anything it's, it's a what do you think about that we're going to talk about that we don't have time to talk about it now because I only have like two minutes um, but we're going to talk about that a little bit as well it's key it's, I think it's opportune at this moment because Mark's doing a sermon currently on authority structures and the key to understanding that dilemma should we go with, should we do what the Bible says or should we do what the rabbi says the rabbis say Generally speaking, which halakha should we follow? Generally speaking, Bible or rabbis? The Word of God. The word of God. You, might, you might be surprised at what my answer is on this one, though. We'll see. Anyway, I, I agree with that, too. You're right. Word of God should be. But the, and, 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 and it tells us, you know, your months, your months are supposed to start by the sighting of the moon, and, and, when, and when the uh, barley is ripe, and then, you know, that's when your month starts, and that's the first month, and then 14 days later, here's Passover, and then blah, blah, blah. But we'll see. So next week, unless I have a lot of questions from you all that get turned in, I'm actually going to start going through this apologetic section real quick. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but just enough so that we can maybe get an appreciation for the fact that Passover today in the 21st century is largely um, participated by uh, uh, what's the word I want to say? It's largely managed by the synagogue of today, and the synagogue of today doesn't doesn't look too favorably upon Christians wanting to really in, engage themselves in these these events, because the, the the synagogue of today doesn't really 
see any need for Christians to get involved. Because the Christians want to put Jesus back into this thing, and the, and the synagogue of the day wants to have their satyrs without, a, without Yeshua. So we're going to look a little bit at that. Um, we need to know who our brothers in Messiah are, uh, the Christians. But we also need to know who our brothers in the synagogue are, the, uh, the Jewish people who don't yet know Yeshua. Um, I think it would be a worthwhile study just for a little while, maybe a week or two, to look and see some of the reasons why they reject Yeshua, why they reject Christianity. You've got the study, so feel free to read ahead. Okay? So with that, it's 7.50. I'll close this class out. You've got 10 minutes. Let me dismiss in prayer. you got 10 minutes. My next class, What is Food, starts right here at 8 o'clock sharp. So let me close real quick. Abba, I bless your name and thank you for the opportunity to teach. I thank you for the participation of the students and I bless you in anticipation of the, um, uh, uh, the things that are they, they are going to engage from the text. Uh, Father, I know that this is a, um, an opportune moment for you to teach us and to continue to grow us up as children of the living God. Help us to prepare ourselves for the Passover that's coming up this year. Help us to press in, Father, by your Spirit, realizing that we don't need to go round and round year after year in the same muck. We need to cry out for freedom, and this is that season. So bless you, Father, in advance for your freedom. And it's in Yeshua's authority, we bless you. Amen. That concludes our show for today. It is my desire that this continuing series of teachings will assist the average non-Jewish believer or new Messianic Jewish believer in his desire to become a more mature child of God. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your forefathers and loved them. And he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations, as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. Because the Torah is written on the hearts of all who truly name the name of Yeshua as Lord and Savior, it is meant to be followed to the best of our ability. We have no reason for fear of condemnation or the trappings of legalism. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. The intro and outro song were written, produced, and performed by Ryan Kingsley. For more information on contacting Ryan, you can reach me by email at yeshua613 at hotmail.com. That's Y E S H U A number 613 at hotmail.com. Or visit our website at graftedin.com. That's graftedin.com. 